Could drinking beer be the path to creating new leather alternative fashion products? Welcome to the Circular Economy Show. I'm your host, Finn, and in today's episode, we'll explore Arda Biomaterials' journey of transforming beer byproducts into new products, and how companies like the Mills Fabrica empower businesses like Arda to turn their waste into value. We'll also talk about the role of investment and venture capital, also known as VCs. I'm joined by Brett Cotton, the co-founder of Arda Biomaterials, and Amy Sang, the head of Europe at the Mills Fabrica. I hope you enjoy the conversation. Welcome both, and thanks for joining me today. Brett, I'm going to start with you. You're the co-founder of Arda Biomaterials. Could you tell us about your products and summarize your journey from the lab to the consumer? Yeah, thanks for having me, Finley. So at Art of Biomaterials, we're a new kind of chemistry and biopolymers company, and we transform waste and co-products into these new polymers and materials. The first one that we're focused on is actually a pretty fun one. We work with the beer breweries and whiskey distilleries to transform their spent barley grains, which they extract sugar from, into a variety of different materials. The first one being a new kind of leather-like material. So we can extract the proteins that are left behind manipulate them and create a new material that is plant-based, plastic-free, animal-free, rubber-free. And because it's made of proteins, just like animal leather is, all of the tips and tricks from the past hundreds of years of of leather tanning, most of those actually work on our material too. Cool. I think, yeah, I, like most people, probably like the sound of, you know, drinking more beer leading to a regenerative future. So what were the sort of big milestones or hurdles you had to overcome? Yeah, so when we first started out, I met my co-founder through this funny program called Entrepreneur First. And I say it's funny because it's kind of like Love Island mixed with The Apprentice or Shark Tank or Dragon's Den. So you go in to find a business partner and it's about 80 people and they come from all sorts of different backgrounds, investment banking, software engineers, former like Olympians. They're quite successful people. And you go in trying to find a business partner. I got quite lucky that I found a chemist who just graduated with a PhD from Oxford. And so we immediately got together and we were the couple that stuck through the whole entire process without breaking up. And we ended up pitching early for investment from Entrepreneur First, got it. And right after we moved into a small lab in White City in London, because before this we were in TJ's kitchen. So it it wasn't a proper lab setup at all. But we ended up raising a a pre-seed investment in March of 2023 which was a really tough fundraising environment. Only about three or four of the companies funded out of 17 were able to get a round done at that time. I have to say the market's not gotten much better, but we were able to get it across the line and we subsequently moved into a facility in a place called Bermondsey, which is just south of Tower Bridge and London Bridge. And it is the historic leather tanning district of London. But also after the leather tanners moved out, a lot of the beer breweries moved in. So it's become the craft leather, uh, craft beer brewing hub of London. And so we are able to take all the spent grain created by these different microbreweries and convert it in our own facility next door. Uh, some of the challenges, though, have been in just uh, creating a new material takes time. And we've had to do hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of iterations. It's also been in building a team and making sure you get the right balance of, of skills on board, right personality fits, um, fundraising, as I mentioned, but we've had a pretty good go of it over the past two and a half years. Yeah, so it sounds like you've done quite a lot in a, a short space of time. Um, but t- typically, scaling has proven challenging in the biomaterial space. So what does that look like for you? Definitely. So I was quite a skeptic, actually, when we first entered into the space, because we saw the um, greenwashed materials where you take in, say, pineapple or apple or grape or mango and just dump in plastic. And then we saw a whole host of different biotech approaches like mycelium, bacterial cellulose, cultivated leather. And a lot of these have raised hundreds of millions, but have failed to scale despite all the promises. And so I was quite skeptical. I thought, oh, the market's pretty crowded. But when it, we got to creating Arda, we saw a path where scalability could actually be one of our greatest strengths. So for us, we take in the feedstock, this barley that the brewers have done us a favor. They've extracted the sugars that we don't want leaving behind protein and fiber. And we can mine that grain for the proteins in the same kinds of equipment the brewers have just extracted the sugar in. And so once we get this protein, it's essentially a soup. 
And we can add in different ingredients that help to bind the proteins together for strength, but also things like natural vegetable oils to make it more flexible and have a nice drape. And it's then in the same kinds of equipment that you find in the plastic films industry or plastic leather industry that we can put our protein soup through and get these sheets and rolls of material. So actually, you can go from a brewery's waste to a new material in under 24 hours at scale. And our yields are such that you would only need a couple brewers to make tens of millions of meters, which would be over 1% of global leather demand just from a couple of breweries. So scale is one of our, our greatest strengths, and we think we have a, a path to actually undercutting the price of plastic and leather at scale. Yeah, wow. So a lot of potential there, really. And um, we'll talk a bit more about scale later. But I was just interested to find out about like how you measure your impact. Yeah, so it depends on who you talk to and what they care about. Personally, for me, I'm very much uh, an advocate for animals. And for as long as I can remember, I never wanted to eat them. <laughs> and we are, my co-founder Tisha and I, both um, in regards to replacing animals, think that we have a good shot. There's this common myth that animal leather is a byproduct of the meat industry. But if you look at it, similar to the organs and connective tissue, these things are sold off and they generate a lot of revenue for factory farms. So you have all these different innovators and we can each sort of dismantle the cow as a factory for making things, make each of those more efficient and remove those revenue streams from bad players like these huge industrial factory farms. But the other piece that a lot of people don't know is leather is coated in plastic and it's full of chemicals. So before these existed, there used to be something called vegetable tanning, which used natural ingredients like oak bark to turn a rotting skin into what we know as leather. But over time, about in the 1950s, some clever chemists realized, well, vegetable tanning takes months. What if we could drop this down to a day or two by using toxic chemicals like chromium? And then on top of this, most leather is top coated in plastic. So for one, Tej and I want to remove animals from the supply chain. But for two, there's been about a decade of research in using plant proteins to replace plastics, particularly out of places like Cambridge here in the UK. And what we're able to do is manipulate these proteins to mimic the structure of animal collagen, but also to replace plastic. So you hit a, a twofer, both on animals and plastic, and people care about different things. So, yeah. Yeah, nice. No, interesting. So it's kind of that going backwards to go forwards approach. Um, Amy, just to bring you in now and, and sort of introduce the Mills Fabrica and what they do. Uh, how do you support innovators just beyond investment? Yeah, sure. So at the Mills Fabrica, we really take on a 360 approach when it comes to supporting innovators and accelerating sustainability for the industry. So for our investment fund, we invest in startups globally, and this isn't limited to any certain kind of geographical regions, and we focus on B2B innovations that are driving positive impact across the supply chains of both textile and agri-food. And we recognize that for a startup to have the best chance of success, it takes more than just funding. It's about finding the right partners and having a strong network of industry experts around you. So at the Mills Fabrica, we have a good relationship with the brands, the manufacturers, the investors, which means we're able to make the right connections to the startups. And through our events that we host and Fabrica X, which is our innovation gallery and concept store here in King's Cross, we really provide a platform to showcase these exciting innovations to both industry and public to really educate, inform and inspire collaboration and ultimately raise awareness of these technologies. And Arda Biomaterials actually participated in our Biomaterials Reimagined campaign and exhibition last year in Fabrica X. And also in addition to this, we have co-working spaces um, in London, which provides a home for these startups where they can mingle and connect with like-minded entrepreneurs and other organizations. Cool. And yeah, so investment is key. Collaboration is key. And, and Brett is one of the beneficiaries of, of the collaborative projects. Um, but yeah, the collaboration is key argument is not new. So what pra how does this work practically? Like what can we do to make things happen at scale? Yeah, you're right. Collaboration definitely is not new, but I think it's important to highlight uh, collaborating with a right partner who has the same values and objectives as you. So a brand who's kind of in it for the long run, especially when it comes to biomaterials. I'm sure, Brett, you can speak to this. The first product, the first prototype is never perfect. And it requires continuous 
R&D, experimentation, trials, but also really productive feedback from the industry partner for the startup to know what to improve or change and why. So this can help the startup understand how the material, biomaterial works with other materials that the brand uses, how it behaves and functions outside of a lab environment and how it can become integrated into the production supply chain. So I think that a true partnership is one where each party can be totally transparent and are working towards the same goal. Nice. Yeah. And, and you know, as you say, there's a lot of trials involved, a lot of pilots. So let's talk a bit more about the financial aspect now. Do you think that biomaterials can be commercially viable? You know, what, what does the Mills Fabrica look for when they're, when they're investing? I think biomaterials can absolutely be commercially viable, especially as increasingly there is more demand from brands and also consumers to switch to more sustainable alternatives, which can not only lead to improving the state of our planet, but also helps companies meet their net zero or carbon reduction targets, for example, and ultimately reduce their costs if, if they introduce more innovative manufacturing practices. And from an investor's perspective at the Mills Fabrica, we look for three key things. So the first is technology. So how innovative is the solution? We look at the founders and also the team's expertise and experience. And we also need to ensure that the quality and performance must meet, if not surpass the incumbent materials. So that's first thing. Second thing is scalability. So, of course, there should be decent market size and demand. And we look at how the startup is able to meet that growing demand by having a scalable solution. Uh, should be regulation compliant and have applications for a variety of companies across the industry. And looking at how production can be scaled and the cost of production ideally must be competitive with existing methods. And then that brings us on to the third point is impact. So what is the technology's ability to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, reduce land and water use, and how are they able to measure the impact of their solution? So those are the three things we look at when we're investing. Nice. And then to bring that back to you, Brett, um, what do companies like Arda look for when, when seeking investment? Yeah, well, the investment is is first and foremost, right? It's a um... It's a really tough market out there. We're seeing lots of companies struggling, taking bridge rounds, down rounds. And so beggars can't be choosers. But if you're lucky enough, then you want to look for several other things. So um, if you can get a little bit of a head start on your next raise with investors that are willing to back you and follow on into the next round, or at least help you and have a great network across the US, Europe, and Asia to help you get that next round across, that's great. Um, also, there's a lot of VCs out there most of them are not coming from a place where they've operated businesses before. So if you can find VCs that have some operational team members, that can come in very handy. Um, so in terms of sales or negotiating contracts, off-take agreements, hiring, just going to them with your basic business building uh, problems as you grow the company, that is also very helpful. And then the other one is commercial contacts. So you find VCs or corporate venture arms or family offices or angels who are really well tapped into certain industries. So for us, we cover quite a lot. So upstream in our process, that is beer breweries and whiskey distilleries. Downstream in our process, that is the fashion industry, footwear, sports, automotive, airline, packaging. And they can really help tap you into these spaces. So we can cast a wide net at first, but then really funnel down into where is the best product market fit, who are the best off takers of our material at scale, and then you can go and expand to other categories. But for us, it's absolutely crucial after we raise this round to get those binding contracts uh, ahead of building our first scaled facility. Nice. And yeah, it's, as I said earlier, a lot of potential, but a lot of work still to do. Um, just to round it up on a more positive note, I'd be curious to know sort of what's exciting you uh, in this field at the moment? It could be a process, input, measurement framework. Uh, what's particularly cool and in innovative that sort of has the potential to make this space scale? I'll start with you, Brett. <laughs> so I come from the world of biotechnology, synthetic biology. I love it. Uh, but when I entered that accelerator, I was looking for a synthetic biologist and I ended up with a chemist 
which was actually one of my not not the best subjects in in school. I was much more into biochemistry than pure organic chemistries. And TJ really opened my eyes that chemistry is so, so scalable. And I've seen some other founders with biotech backgrounds now shift towards a more chemistry approach. The reason being, it's incredibly efficient. It's a 20th century technology that we can really push the needle forward because we have a new understanding where before plastics existed, these materials that are protein-based, they were used. Henry Ford famously wore a soybean suit and was looking at incorporating soy proteins into automotive interiors. But it's only 100 years later with a newfound understanding of chemistry and molecules that we can actually bring this forward past where they, they could have gone. The other reason it stopped is because plastics and petrochemicals were these new wonder materials. So I'd say I have a newfound appreciation of chemistry-based approaches in the past couple of years. Nice, yeah. A little history lesson as well for the audience there as well. Uh, over to you, Amy. Is there anything particular that stands out for you? Yeah, for me, I mean, when we're looking at innovation in textiles as a whole, it's really about finding alternatives to synthetics and solution to the fashion industry's overuse and over-reliance on raw materials, but also ways of recycling textile waste. So some of the startups that I've seen recently that are really, um, that really excite me is the ones that use biotechnology and textile recycling. Um, so just to give an example here, there's one called Epoch Biodesign. So they're based here in the UK. So they are developing enzymes to recycle nylon. So they combine physics-based modeling and generative AI with unique biological data sets and know how to create enzymes with novel functionalities. And the enzymes can recycle nylon from both pre- and post-consumer waste. And in the end, they can produce an output with the same performance as virgin material. So this kind of innovation has huge potential to transform uh, the fashion industry. So that's something um, that really excites me. Yeah, amazing. And it's quite a nice, positive way to end. As, as we know, the, the, for the circular economy to scale, we need these innovations, we need these partnerships, we need the investment. So um, yeah, thank you both for joining me today. And thank you for our audience for listening. Thank you for listening to this podcast by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. If you enjoyed it, please leave a like, comment and subscribe or leave a review. See you next time.